since moving from Alexandra Palace in North London, the show is now in Farnborough in a single exhibition hall. And one of the things that grabs you straight away is you get to see the whole of the dinghy scene all in one hall. And it makes for a pretty impressive sight. But that's not really what makes this show special. What makes it special is the people that come here and the people that exhibit here. It's got a very, very different feel. Probably around 50% of the exhibitors here are class associations and they are brimming with enthusiasm. And that you simply can't miss. And this year, I'm accompanied once again by my long suffering crew here. Ellie, who, uh, as you probably noticed by the name strap, shares the same surname, funny enough. There we go. We're going to be strolling around the show and picking out a few things that catch our eye. Now, as well as discovering what's new at the show, every time I come to this show, I'm drawn to certain corners of it. And one is this, the 5.0. I still think it's absolutely beautiful boat. Ellie thinks I go all misty-eyed every time I see one. She's probably right. It's just a good job I can't afford one. And anyway, apart from that, look at that string fest. I'm never going to be able to understand how to control all of that. But it doesn't make me not want one. One of the other boats that you always have to go and have a look at, and it's along similar lines, is the Merlin Rocket. Have a look at this. See what I mean? They are so pretty, but they're also incredibly complex. Well, at least that's what they look like to me. Those in the class will tell you that they're not that complex at all, that once they're set up, they're dead easy to sail. I think I might need a little bit convincing on that. But to help me do that, Caroline Croft here, this is her boat. And Caroline, tell me about this boat because you launched this last year. As you know, I should wind back a little bit. First of all, I should say you've been in the Merlin Rocket class for quite a while. Yeah, about 10 years now. Right, so yeah. you know these boats yeah, inside out. Yes, do, yeah. So you launched this boat, this is your own boat, mm -hmm. you launched this boat last year, but you optimised it for you so, yeah. and for female sailing. Tell us a bit about that. What did you do? Yeah, so um, the boats are quite full on. They're quite, you know, when the wind's blowing, they're, they're quite hard work. So being a bit smaller, often sailing with a female crew as well. So we usually two girls in a boat. So we don't have the weight and we don't have the strength compared to the boys. It's just facts. We can be down the gym, but it's just not going to be the same. So it was really important that all the systems were easy to use and easy to pull. In my old boat, I really struggled to pull the kicker on. When it got really windy, you got all the rake on and you're hanging on and you just couldn't get the leech closed. Um, so one of the things we did is we put a 24 to one kicker on instead of a 16 to one, which most of them have. And it means you can fine tune as well now. So it wasn't like you release it and then you like lose your arm because you've got the load of it coming through the boom. But um, so now we can fine adjust and the crews can do it as well. So whoever have got in the boat is easeable and manageable for everybody. Um, and then one of the other big things we've done is, because the melons are quite down, built down to weight, we, um, we have to add about 10 kilos of correctorship. So we've got some flexibility in the weight there. And what we decided to do this time was to increase all the block sizes. So a lot of them have about 20 mils on. We've gone 30 mils, and we've even got a 60 on the back of the rake. Um, and that just reduces the friction and that makes all the ropes and run smoother. And so when we're raking, it's easy and you don't have to use two hands because when you're at the back, you don't have two hands. So you can kind of tweak and it's easy and it's fast. So there's quite a few things that we've done like that that just make it easier. Getting rid of the friction, um, it means you can get your head out of the boat and pick the shifts instead of worrying about where your settings are. Has it worked? Yeah, it's great. So. Uh, the first event we did, she actually won straight out of the, back, out of the packet. We we're still drilling holes and tying, tying knots in the first race. Um, but yeah, it's made my life a lot easier. And it, as well as with the crews that I sail with too, we can be up there and give the boys a good run for their money. And it's no longer the boat's too hard. It's, oh, I didn't do that start very well, or I messed up, messed up that first beat. And it's more on how you sail as a sailor rather than the capability of what you can do in the boat. That's really interesting because in, a, in the sailing world that's so dominated nowadays by one design boats, yes. I mean, you just couldn't do that in a one design, could no, you? I mean, you, you give us a comparison. So what are we talking weight wise? What are, your, what are you sailing? What weight are you sailing at? Um, and how does that compare to the boys? Yeah, so we're about 
130 kilos all up. Um, and some of the bigger boys are probably 80, Helms 80 to 90 and Cruz perhaps 70 plus for the, some of the bigger boys. And they've got the height as well. So they've got the leverage. And yes, the boats are wide. So if you compare it to something like a Scorpion where they're very narrow, we, we have got some. But I'm not six foot and I never will be. <laughs> We're going to have to stop talking about this, you know, because it's starting to make me think maybe we could optimise it for an extra medium size. Yeah. No, we must stop talking about that because I don't need another boat on my list. What I do want to talk about is last year there was a women's and a youth's national championships. And they both sound interesting, but tell me a bit about the women's national championships because that sounded like a great incentive. Yeah, so it's something I've been pushing for a few years, so being on the committee, and really the only female helm at the moment is constantly on the circuit doing everything. We do have female helms and that has definitely grown in the last few years. Um, but for multiple reasons, you know, um, some of our friends have had kids and stuff and it's just not quite as easy. So I really wanted to create an environment in the Merlin where women can have a day's training and a day's racing to feel confident. Because if you're on a start line with 40 other boats, mostly men. There's a lot of testosterone flying around and it can be quite daunting and a bit scary. And I wanted to allow women a safe space to be able to sail, learn some new skills and then put it into practice with racing. And I, the idea is to get more women in the back of the boat. So I am not the only one in the back. So we're definitely increasing our numbers and there's a lot of positive feedback. And I think it's something we as a as a um, as a dinghy world we really need to encourage because we are dwindling on the female side and, and it'd be great to see some more for women in the back and how did that play out how many boats did you get how many teams did um, you get for the nationals so i think we had um about 18 signed up and then 16 did all the racing i think so it was good for a lot of borrowed boats you know everyone all the guys were on hand to help and support you know and were they all offered. were they all female crews or were they a mixture of uh, male and female male hounds i think uh, male crews sorry um i think there was only about four right so the majority, the majority was all female, female uh, helm and crew and it was it, it was a bit of an odd feeling being out there it's like where are all these women come from there's no men around and it was really great it's a great incentive and a lovely looking boat. Thank you. And yeah. I really am going to have to leave before <laughs> I want to buy one. Oh, you'll want one. You'll want one <laughs> I always want one. Thank yeah, you very thank much. You. Part of the problem with coming to this show is that you end up with quite a long list of boats that you'd really like. And even if I could afford them, I don't think there are enough weekends or days off in the year to actually sail them. But anyway, when's that ever mattered? Anyway, here's another boat that I really would like having a go in. It's been around for a long time. I actually sailed one as a kid, but I still quite fancy having a go. Maybe it's just my age, I don't know. Here's another boat that keeps making it onto my list of, hmm, would like one of those, the Hadron. It's not actually that new. It's been out for quite a few years now, but every time I go past it, I sort of quite like it. Maybe because it reminds me a bit of our own 400s. It's got sort a of similar kind of configuration. It's a single-handed boat, a sit-in boat. There is a suggestion from my rather uncharitable crew, Ellie, who was filming this, that it's a boat for men of a certain age. I think that's very unfair. The continued success and popularity of the international moth needs no explanation. And when it comes to people within that class, Simon Hiscox doesn't really need much of an introduction. But you're here now with something a little bit differently with the switch. Tell us a bit about this boat. Yeah, the switch here, which is, I mean, the best way to describe it is, is actually, it's a one design moth. Uh, the moth is a development class, as you well know, it's, it, it will continue to develop. And, and this is a sort of a, a design of moth that's, I guess you could say it's frozen in time uh, and, and it's going to be a strict one design class in its own right. Why, why do you think that's necessary? Because the, the wasp is there, that's a, that's a one design that was based around the moth concept. Why another one? Uh, well, I think the wasp builds a really important niche in, in the sailing scene. Uh, it's developed a really strong foiling pathway. 
Um, and I think that the switch and the, well, the moth potentially has a, an exit point to that pathway. And the switch is certainly going to fulfill an exit point to that pathway. I think it's really important to go one design because you remove the cost of development. You can buy a boat. It doesn't depreciate in boat speed. And most one designs that are built well, which this one is, uh, don't depreciate greatly in value either. So you get all those plus points of the value of the boat, as well as really close one design racing. Because a top, a good quality, brand new foiling moth is pretty expensive, isn't it? What kind of, what are you going to be paying for a new one? Yeah, I mean, you pay around 40, 50,000 pounds for a, for a competitive new moth. It's not cheap. It's the craft, in some ways it's it's more than that. It's the boat and its history and stuff. So we don't really, we're not trying to be, to steal that. Uh, but we, it is a piece of equipment that provides that level of performance, the same sailing characteristics, uh, at a price that I think is more affordable than uh, what is, than that what is there. Landed into the UK with covers, uh, trolley, everything you need to go sailing, £21,000, including the VAT. How heavy can you be to sail uh, these? I mean, I'd say 100 kilos plus is, is that this boat would take 110, 150 wow. kilos. Really? Uh, you know, probably could do some damage if you fall in the wrong place, but right. you'd have to fall really hard and yeah. regularly. No, it would be all right. Uh, 115 kilos. Yeah, you would foil. There is hope for me. Not the lightest wind. No, but there's hope for me yet. All there I is, hope, is yeah. some ability. Yeah. <laughs> no, you just need a steady day. Nice, steady. Right. Perfect okay, day. Okay, you're on. I'll Be come your first down. go. Right, you've convinced me. Yeah. That didn't take long, did it? In the dinghy sailing world, one of the most significant boats in dinghy design history was the Firefly because it was one of the first, it might even have been the first dinghy to plane. And this is the Firefly, but this is a very special Firefly. Isn't is it? indeed. Tell us a bit about this one. So this was the British entry for the 1948 Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, um, sailed at Weymouth um, by Arthur MacDonald. Um, the idea was basically after the war, the government were, were very short of money. Um, there weren't many single-handed boats, uh, sorry, um, one design boats on the market at all. Um, and Ferry Marine, which was Ferry Aviation during the war, said, we can build the number you want in the time that you want and at the cost you want. And this was used then as the Olympic boat for the single-handed class in the 1948 Olympics. It was the year that Mark Elvstrom won the, uh, won the Olympics, obviously went on to be an incredible icon in the dinghy sailing world. Uh, the Elvstrom Baylor, probably his most famous design piece. Um, so this one was, uh, like I say, used by Arthur MacDonald, who was the uh, British entry. Um, and I think he came fifth overall in the Olympics. Um, and then it was sold off. The ore was sold off um, after the Olympics in 1948. Um, and then was found um, about 10 years ago, I think, um, in a garage in Norfolk, in a garage sale. And then was uh, restored, or well, not really restored, but um, brought back to life, shall we say, um, by Al Vines, who's one of our patrons. Right. So, yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. I'd forgotten um, the fact that this boat started life as a single hand, or certainly for the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it is actually a pretty iconic boat in, I know, again, I know you don't like that phrase, but it is an iconic boat because it was one of the only boats to be designed to fit a woman's body. So the crew, it was designed for a, a lady crew, for Oxford and Cambridge University to compete in by Uffa Fox in 1938. Um, and the idea was to have a female crew and a male helm, as it was back then, um, and this boat was specifically designed for that. Um, I don't know the technicalities of what makes it different, but I do know that was the, uh, that was the initial idea. And is um, this boat still sailed? It was sailed. Um, it is sailed. I, it doesn't get as much use as a <laughs> slightly newer boat. Um, 
I don't think as a class we want to risk it getting any uh, <laughs> any, any damage really. No, but it's absolutely um, gorgeous. Isn't it? It's fantastic. Is, but it looks it's unmistakably a firefly as well, absolutely. isn't it? I mean how absolutely. the firefly class is one that has gone on and carried on being successful. Yeah, very much so. How well first of all, why why is that the case? Why has the firefly lasted such a long time? Firefly is an incredible ethos about the whole class itself. It's an incredibly welcoming class. It's a you know fantastic a, a group of people to be involved in. It always has been a thing. But from the class and the boat itself, everything we do, we try and maintain cost, keep costs low. And the idea is that you can get racing for as little money as possible. Students can race for as little as £200 at a nationals event. They can get a boat, cost £200 and sail it and, and do well. You're saying and the that's boat the idea. Costs the boat costs £200. You can buy no. a second hand firefly, wooden firefly, get it rigged with the help of the people in the association and get on the water and it can cost as little as £200. What? Um, my firefly that I sail now, which is F3333, uh, cost me £200 um, and I've sailed it at the Nationals three or four times now um, and, it, and sail it most weekends. So it's, uh, it's remains a competitive boat and they're still out there, those boats as well. How many boats um, do you get at the Nationals? On average between 60 and 70 boats wow. a year. Uh, which is great. And just going back to your original question, which is why does it keep going? Obviously, it's, it's the main boat for students, team racing. And that, again, goes back to its, one, the durability of the boats themselves. They've always been designed as durable, hard-wearing, long-lasting boats. Originally, the design of the hulls, and then later we've influenced that into the Rondar models and now the Ovington model, um, which is part four. They've kept up as well. We've not just sat back like maybe, you know, sounds critical, but some classes have maintained their traditional design. The fireflies move with the times, so it remains a, like I say, a durable fire, um, university boat. You can continue to, to use them. And it's available, so a modern boat is a GRP boat. It is indeed, yeah. Are there any wooden boats nowadays? Absolutely. Um, if I'm being honest, if you look back through the top 10 fireflies at the Nationals, you'll note that at least half of them are wooden fireflies built before the uh, before the 1970s. Wow. Um, they are very competitive, and some would argue that a wooden hull is actually better in a fleet race than uh, than, a, than a, a modern GRP one. Um, again, the modern GRP ones still do well, but I think a lot of people would prefer to stick with their classic one. Really? Um, again, that fits with the ethos of the class. You know, thinking that you know, in, in a world in which we're conscious about what we're using, what we're making, and what we're throwing away. Reusing one of these hulls and converting it to a Mark IV is a very popular thing to do. Um, you can get a Mark IV conversion kit where you basically strip out all the original Firefly and rebuild a Mark IV in it. So, Fantastic. Uh, and have you any idea how many Fireflies have been built? So up to date we are on the Ovington here, which is just next door, is 4444. Um, so there are about 4,500 registered Fireflies. I know there are a significant uh, number more in the team racing world. There's a lot that have been sent over to America that haven't been numbered, that haven't been stamped, but there are more boats than that out there. So, and amazingly, a lot of them survive. Um, the original construction of these wooden hulls um, was they were a coal molded structure, um, which again goes back to the durability of them. Um, and they were made with a wood called Agba, which, is, which doesn't rot as such and is immune to um, the, the, the termites as well. So if it was sent over to hotter climates, termites didn't affect them. So, um, yeah. And, it's, a, and it's, a, it's an international class. It is to a degree, yeah. I mean, we did, uh, back in the sort of 60s, 50s, 60s, a lot of boats were exported abroad, Canada, America. I think there's a few in Australia as well. Um, with them being a team racing boat, they were chosen by the military. So the Air Force, the Army and Navy used them as their team racing boats and in their in their sailing clubs, and of course, they ended up transported all over the world with the, with the army. So there's a, there are a few dotted around everywhere. Amazing. So um, and a big fleet in Ireland as well. Actually, a lot of team racing in Ireland as well with the, with, with, right. with the Firefly, and the class is absolutely brilliant. Second mm -hmm. to none. They are so welcoming. We have brilliant events, and it's well, yeah, well worth a look into for anyone looking. So yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks pleasure. for talking us through that. No, it's a pleasure. That took me back actually looking at that because one of the first boats we sailed was a Firefly, wasn't it? It was indeed, a tiny spinnaker. <laughs> <laughs> spinnaker as in the lake. That one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember them being quite tippy. 
I don't remember a lot of it, but don't you? we've moved on since then. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. But what a fascinating story, isn't really it? I mean, also for a class to be that strong this far on, I mean, that says a lot about how the class structure's organised. Back in the early 1990s, there was an, a revolution in dinghies, a, an explosion of skiff-style designs. Part of it was led by the Laser 5000, which was a contender for the Olympics. It didn't actually make it through, but it inspired a whole generation of design. It was a fascinating era. And one of the boats that was involved then is a boat you don't see much of nowadays, it's called the ISO. Bob Liddell has been the uh, class chair. chair for, you said, quite a long time. Something like 20 years. Right. So <laughs> Bob knows a lot about the ISO, but the ISO is going through a new phase, isn't it? So tell us a bit about what's happening now. Well, we're presenting the new ISO 2 at the, uh, the show today. Um, the changes are significant reduction in weight. If you put the camera down about there, that's what we've saved. That's what we've taken out of the boat. So it's considerably lighter than the uh, original boats. Um, so it should make it just a little bit faster and a bigger grin factor. Um, we've simplified the deck layout a little bit and made a bit more room for the crew, make it more saleable in that, in that sense. But otherwise, the rig is the same. The hull of shape is exactly the same because it's come out of the original moulds. The deck is the same, that's out of the original moulds with a couple of minor tweaks to it. Um, so the major, the major advance is in internally, in the structure, Ginger Boats, who made the boat, have made a, a fantastic job of stiffening it up and taking all the weight out of it and making it look, as you see today behind me, look absolutely fantastic. Um, so we're really looking forward to getting it on the water. I mean, it's so new, we we're still finishing the rigging this morning, so we haven't had it on the water. The nearest water it's been to is the rain in the M6 yesterday. So. Um, Really looking forward to seeing that uh, and see how it performs. And you can buy it, so you can buy the boat as it is, as a complete boat, rig and everything else. Yes. But you can also buy a replacement hull, you were telling me. Yes, about. that's right. Um, the aim and object is to um, update the, the whole class by providing the facility that if somebody has a very tired hull, one or two of them are very tired, um, to actually uh, buy the hull, a bare hull, and transfer all the parts from their existing hull onto the new one, and essentially have a new boat for very, very little money. I mean, when you say very little money, roughly, what are we talking about? Well, you're talking uh, certainly. Uh, the expectation is less than five k, probably less than four. Right. So we'll see after the show when Ginger Boats have had the chance to uh, really look at the pricing and announce the pricing formally. So please don't take that gospel as gospel, but um, that's the sort of current yeah. talk around the, uh, uh, around the class. It's that sort of order of magnitude. Um, and the whole boat, uh, we think, is just going to be just into five figures on the road. Really? That's pretty good. Because what strikes me looking at this boat, I remember sailing this boat, one of the very first ones, when it first came out in the early 90s. Yes. You look at it now, and it's still a very good-looking contemporary boat, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It hasn't dated at all. Well, I we think it's very kind of you to say so, and we have said that consistently in dinghy shows for the last 20-something years since I've been in the class, that we like to think, but then I guess everybody else likes to think, that we're the, we're the best boat in the hall. How many, how many were built, do you know? Originally, there were around about 750, about 700 built originally. Um, the, they started at 501, and I think the last boat that was made was 1207, right. 1207, 1208. Did they stay largely in the UK, or did they end up no, in No, the they're actually all the way across the world. Um, the furthest afield is uh, Belize. Um, so there's about six or seven boats out there. Don't hear from them very much, the distance, but um, but apart from that, Europe has got a very big following. Italy being the biggest, there's around about 65, 70 boats in uh, in Italy. Um, some in a small cluster around the um, uh, Lake Maggiore, Milan area. Others scattered a little bit further afield. Some on Como, mostly mostly in the north. There's a couple of boats as far south as Rome. Um, across the rest of the Europe. Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, certainly quite a number of dotted around in France, 
who unfortunately we don't hear from. French guys, come talk to us, come to the event. Uh, Germany, Holland, quite a number in Holland, and certainly going further afield, Poland, Latvia, Bulgaria, I believe. Uh, odd boats here and there, so quite a big following all round. Um, all buying spares from the UK. Our spare supply is secure through Vantage Sailing, who are just exhibiting the buzz on our, our left here. Um, so we've, we've got all of that side of it sorted out. As spares is quite often a, um, a concern for older boats, not a problem for the ISO. We've got everything. And being our own licensee, um, we're in the position to be able to uh, adapt very quickly to changing market conditions. So if one part becomes obsolete, we can type approve uh, something else and go, sailors, this is what you need to go and buy instead. How do you deal? You mentioned right at the start about the fact that the new hull means that you're taking 30 kilos out of it. Yes. How does that work then when it comes to racing? If this boat's going to be 30 kilos lighter than the existing fleet, how are you going to deal with that? Well, to be honest, yes it is. And we haven't a clue at the moment. Um, we've been thinking very much a part of get to the show, show it off, get the response, get the boat sold, get them on the water, and it'll be a nice problem to have. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you, Matt. Thanks for good, coming by. Thank good you for coming with to it all. It's a fascinating um, project, and I wish you well. Please track us. We'll do. Well, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? The idea of replacing your hull. Yeah. rather than the whole boat. Makes sense to me, I think. We'd be looking to get a new boat, and if we could just get a new hull, I mean, it seems to make sense. Yeah. Well, we saw, uh, was it a couple of years ago, with the uh, Laser 4000, they weren't replacing the hulls, but they were replacing, you could buy a new rig, and they upgraded it, and it looked really good, mm, didn't it? Yeah. I think there's a lot, to be, a lot to be said for that. I'm, I'm impressed, actually. That's it's another really... one on our list. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> It's funny who you bump into at this show and what you see at this show. Because here's a triangular compass. You might think it looks a little bit like the tactic compass that was so has been so popular in dinghy racing scenes. And if you really know your stuff, you might recognise this chap as well because he's the man who designed it. But you've been, well, we haven't seen you for quite some time and now you turn up, uh, you've just shown me this new product. It looks really interesting. Give us an overview. What, what's it all about? It's a compass for racing dinghies. It's a class legal compass. Uh, it's got a timer and, and actually it's got two lines of display. So that means you can show the tactical information, the compass information, as well as the timer, which means before the start, you're not compromised and perhaps getting to the wrong end of the line because you hadn't noticed the shift. Um, and, and talking about getting there on time, with the three button timer, that timing synchronization is much easier than it's ever been before. You know, you can start the time, resynchronize, even adjust up and down whilst it's running. Uh, and of course, size of digits matters because seeing these things is important. And these digits are 30 millimeters, which believe it or not, is the maximum allowed under class rules. Does that, so the timer on the bottom, once it's counted down, does it then count up? Uh, you can set it to do as you, as you wish. Um, normally, most people, I think, once it's gone to, 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 to zero, will then move to a compass or a tactical mode. And that means you can actually see your tactics and your bearing in case you're finding a mark, um, you can choose. Right. We've got a, um, a tactic on our, on our 400, which we've had for many years, actually, and it's absolutely superb. But I do like the look of that to have, as you say, both lines of, of information. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, we look forward to seeing that come out on the market. When's it going to come out? How much will it be? So there'll be some samples being tested over the summer volume production in September and it's £345 including the mass bracket. All right, look forward to that. Thanks for showing it to us. Well that's been pretty interesting isn't it? What, um, what caught your eye today? I think for me it's got to be the Merlin rocket story. It's just such yeah. an interesting one and a one which is really fascinating to see how a development class is able to use the flexibility that they have compared to what we sell and we're stuck with our 400. And for them to be able to use different techniques and put different things on their boats, which can really help balance out that gender disbalance that we sometimes have with some big bulky boats like a Merlin. And um, it was really interesting to hear what she'd done in particular to her boat. And it may well be something that they use going forward in different 
boats and different classes. That's the whole exciting thing about development boats. Yeah. And to see what she'd done in the nationals as well and how that's been used this year to really encourage people. Sounded like a great atmosphere. It sounds like something that maybe should be replicated across the sport a bit more. Yeah, it does sort of, it is a reminder, isn't it? But when she said she's sailing at, what was it, 130 kilos? Yeah. It's a big boat to handle with 130 kilos. And we know what it's like in the 400 where people say it's an intimidating boat. Yeah. And actually, they're not that different in terms of size, are they? Um, but yeah, it just goes to show what you can do when you've got uh, in a development boat, as you say. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the thing that I found interesting, particularly at this show, would probably come under the category of repurposing, really. I thought that the uh, ISO 2 story was a really interesting one because there's a boat that was quite popular back in the 90s and fleet sizes aren't that great now. But with a new hull, just replacing the hull, great way of getting the class going again. And to take 30 kilos out of it is pretty impressive. It just goes to show what modern techniques and a better build quality um, can do. Um, I think what I really quite liked about what he said was, well, how are you going to, when posed with the question, what are you going to do when you take 30 kilos, how are you going to cope with that? Don't know. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> Certainly easier than the diet we're trying to be on, isn't uh, it? So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have one of those boats, yeah. Good oh, idea. Yeah. Right, I think uh, we'll do another little wander, but uh, I think that's probably going to be it from us, isn't yeah. it, from the dinghy show. See you next time.